Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm Charlie Brooker and congratulations, you're through to week nine of lockdown, as we all are. How, how are you coping with this at the moment, Ian? Well, I'm, I'm very thrilled to have you on as host, obviously, the, the purveyor of apocalyptic vision. <laughs> Presumably we get Nostradamus next week. And after that, the four horsemen of the apocalypse are going to sit there and fire some jolly questions at us. I blame you. There was a test earlier on where there were people sitting on in all four of your houses and I was talking to four people in face masks. It was like I was having a breakdown. It was the most Black Mirror thing I've ever seen. And I've sat in the edit for that show. Paul, how are you? Yes, I'm very well. I've been working on my new musical based on the life of Edgar Allan Poe, A Song, A Smile and A Premature Burial, featuring the hit single I Hear You Knocking But You Can't Get Out. <laughs> Well, on Ian's team tonight is author and mathematician Dr Hannah Fry. Uh, Hannah, in 2017, you presented a TV show called Ten Things You Need to Know About the Future. In retrospect, should that have been 11? <laughs> Turns out, yes. Turns out it should have been. <laughs> you must be really delighted, actually, um, with all these, because the news is suddenly full of graphs and bar charts and everyone talking. <laughs> yeah, but most of them are the wrong. Exponentially. <laughs> it's basically, for a mathematician, this pandemic is the best thing that could have possibly happened. Well, OK, but many of them should come with trigger warnings because, uh, I mean, some of them actually make my eyes bleed um, in how wrong they are. And on Paul's team tonight is comedian Mark Steele, who used to travel up and down the country to do local material for his Radio 4 show, Mark Steele's In Town, or as it's now known, Mark Steele Super Spreader. Uh, and now that lockdown's <laughs> easing up, are you looking forward to getting out there again, Mark? Well, I, I am, and I'm not. I'm not going to. It's all right, this, but I'm not going to pretend I enjoy it. You know these people who the infuriating people who love it and go, "Oh, I'm having the lockdown of a lifetime." This morning, I was on a falconry class on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> it's just ha just get through it and be a little bit miserable. I think that is the best way to be. In the news this week, as the lockdown is relaxed, Larry the Cat leaves Downing Street and flouts police advice by heading straight for a popular beauty spot. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know if it's more impressive that the cat can drive or whistle, basically, <laughs> looking at that. Um, He's wearing a protective coat. I think my cat would think he was pretty wimpy out there driving and, and still in camouflage. I wondered how long it would be, Ian, before you referenced that bloody cat of yours. My cat this, my cat that. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're, work you're secretly working on a collection of um, amusing cat anecdotes for a Christmas stocking fella book. I wish it was secret. <laughs> Or amusing. <laughs> Following the news that foreign holidays are looking unlikely this summer, one man has found a creative outlet for his disappointment. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. This is the captain speaking. Uh, just about ready to depart. Should be away on ship. Like <laughs> Later, to make things interesting, he puts it on a spin cycle for a spot of turbulence. Following the government's confused message about whether to stay home or go out, one man tries to do both. <laughs> <laughs> Move in house. Right, let's get on with the show and we start with the bigger stories of the week. Ian and Hannah, have a look at this. It's uh, Boris Johnson's first family photo. Are you one of mine? Um, yeah, I've got to uh, wash your hands of, of everything. Really? And uh, Michael Gove there, looking for someone to blame. And finally, a, uh, a metaphor there for thinking things through before you commit. This is why we need schools to open. I am a free, I am not man, a number, of course, a message we can all get behind. Having effectively um, persuaded us to stay at home, the government is now in the position of trying to persuade us not to stay at home anymore. And this is a bit of a problem because people got very scared and then they're staying a bit scared. Um, so things that most people think should happen, like schools opening, we've got to open schools eventually. Um, but everyone suddenly got very scared and said, oh, well, we don't want to do it now, we don't know how to do it, um, are we going to be safe enough? And again, there hasn't been much of a lead um, in terms of saying, this is what we'll do, it'll be fine. So there are lots of things we could do. Um, but again, no one's sure about the science. But luckily, I've, I've got 
a scientist <laughs> um, on my panel. So whatever I say, even if it's rubbish, I will blame her. <laughs> yeah, I take full responsibility. <laughs> I think the thing I think the thing about um, a lot of this is that there's a difference between the risk to yourself as an individual and the risk to your family and the risk to the country as a whole. And while there are certain things that we can probably do, we can probably risk it as a country as a whole, people slowly going back to work. That doesn't mean that the individual level risk is 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 non-existent. And I think that's the reason why it's just this strange, this strange contradiction. You can see your boss, but you can't see your family. Uh, you know, your cleaner can come around your house, but your 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 best friend can't. It's just a kind of we're in this strange uh, limbo between the two states. Well, you get, it's just been so confusing from the beginning. That's why, isn't it? At the start of it, Boris Johnson was saying, well, I, I, we must shake hands and then change in his mind. So you must uh, not travel unless you're going somewhere and must stay at home at all times when you're not out and go to work, but not travel there. So you must float and that this will come in on Monday unless Monday falls on a Monday. And then they wonder why people are confused. <laughs> well, that made more sense, to be honest, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Primary schools in Denmark have been open for a month. How did that go? It actually went OK. So there was a bit of an increase in transmission initially and then it uh, it stabilised again. So actually it looks like so far it hasn't had the terrifying effect that many, many people fear. Uh, what is one of the more confusing aspects of the... I've just noticed here's a question I should have asked you earlier. What's one of the more confusing aspects of the government's Back to Normal campaign? Um, it is the... I'll give you the answer. It's the, pl <laughs> the planned return no. to school of primary age children <laughs> on June the 1st. What did Michael the, Gove say about You're accusing about the this? government of being confused <laughs> and you've just given us the question after well, we've given you, you the answer. Well, if you won't all... If you won't all say things in the right order for the pieces of paper they've given me remotely from your flipping homes on the other side of the internet, um, within a few minutes on uh, Andrew Marr, Michael Gove made two claims. Do you know what the first claim was? I'm not a sex offender. <laughs> I don't think that... Well, I, I, I imagine he may have said that. But he didn't know, did he? There was no risk of sending children back to school. And then he said there was a risk. He said, yes, teachers will be safe. And then a few moments later, he said, no, I can't guarantee it that no teacher will be infected. What did people do with their newfound freedom this week? They went to the Lake District and to the Peak District and to um, wander around in Wales and Cornwall. They flocked to various beauty spots throughout the country, including uh, Dorset's famous beach at Durdle Door. Uh, let's hope they disinfected the Durdle Door handle. <laughs> Some people are so brilliantly. There was a there's a bloke I heard on a radio phone and he was radio phone in and he said I'm 83 and he said and I I'm going down the market stall same as normal because look at me there's nothing wrong with me and I thought well yeah but there's something about the nature of disease you've not quite grasped that even with really bad diseases you are generally quite fine up until the moment you get the disease. There are no diseases, I mean, I have to ask Hannah for confirmation on this, as far as I know, there are no diseases so bad they make you ill before you get the disease, you stupid idiot. <laughs> I can confirm that science fact, by the way. That's definitely science fact. Brilliant. That's one fact we can lock in. <laughs> Did you see some official police advice to pedestrians? Don't walk on the black part of the zebra crossing. Hop over it. You, you're not a million miles away, actually. <laughs> oh, really? Um, no, no. Yeah. I'm in Kent. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds like you are. No, um, it was, it was. Please don't walk in the road uh, to avoid passing pedestrians. They added, momentarily crossing paths with someone won't give you COVID nineteen. Although I thought that was exactly what the Trace and Track app is meant to, <laughs> <laughs> is meant to be detecting. Isn't it fifteen momentarily contacts? Isn't it about that? It's, when it says momentarily, is it 15 seconds? Yeah, so, like, the, the app pings, but if you're just... If you're uh, close to someone who's got it and it pings once, that doesn't mean that you then have to quarantine. It's like they, they add up an amount of risk um, the more time you spend near someone who's uh, who ends up being positive. Why can't they just wear sirens on their heads all the time, then, people who've got it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been out jogging, and I, I whenever I see pedestrians coming, I, I have run into the road because I know joggers have got a really bad reputation at the moment um and also i think it will cheer them up if they see an amusing road accident so <laughs> yeah. i'm doing my bit <laughs> oh there's another piece of police news this week actually top copper cressida dick uh said some... cressida dick cressida cressida 
Cressida, which sounds better. <laughs> Cressida Deech. She's not an influencer. No, it sounds like, yes, an element of, of French philosophy to it. <laughs> Cressida Deech. I am the philosophical police chief. She said something about the lockdown. It was quite philosophical what she said. Do you know what it was? Yeah, she said people keep getting my name wrong. You could have called her Clarissa Knob, so I suppose we're on to a winner in some respects. No, she pointed out, she revealed that it's easier to police the streets when they're empty. <laughs> yeah. Um, because apparently crime in uh, London has dropped 35% and they've been able to keep tabs on a 1,000 violent offenders across London since the lockdown started. Although, I mean, crime might have fallen, but technically the number of prisoners in Britain rose by 60 million on the 23rd of March. And what's she doing about that? <laughs> <laughs> just to keep you, just to keep you sort of, um, the, your, your mental flow uh, ready, we're going to play a quick game of bird, swan, hamster, cat, yeah? Ray! OK. I'll show you an animal. You have to tell me what the animal is and what they've got to do with this whole virus situation. First up, Hannah, what is this? Swan. <laughs> This is on a level I... with you. This is this is the easier round. Uh, this woman's a scientist the, doing, doing do something. Her. What is this? It's a swan. The tricky Don't part. Don't tell her the what, answer. She it... might not know. It is a swan. She said it was a swan. Oh, I didn't hear that. What's it got to do with coronavirus? Uh, is swan upping isn't happening. Well, it's always been a dirty practice anyway. <laughs> People are staying at home and not going out and swan upping. Dirty bastards. Do you know what swan upping is? Yeah, I do. I saw a bloke do it behind a shed once. <laughs> yeah, I've seen it on the dark web. The dark webbed foot. It's an annual census of the Queen's swans. Ah. It's counting. It's a mathematical exercise. Yes, you should be well across this being a mathematician. I can only apologise. It's the annual counting of the Queen's swans. It's been cancelled, so she's just going to have to struggle by for a whole year without knowing how many swans she's got. Uh, we're all in this together. Oh, there's one thing after another, isn't it? First Prince Andrew, and then that. <laughs> Ian, take a look at this and tell us how it relates to the coronavirus. What animal is this? Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cat, yeah, and I'm not going to mention my own cat, clearly, because I don't want to annoy Paul. Um, <laughs> it's just not worth it. Uh, no. I'm not going to bring Colin up at all. So, cats, can they give you the virus? There was a story about that early on. No, they can't. They can give each other. Don't kiss your cats. Don't kiss your cat. That's oh. the advice, because... I'm sorry to break this to you, Ian. Don't kiss your cat. <laughs> That's the advice from a scientific study in Australia, which is trying to establish right. whether cat-to-human transmission of the virus is possible. So if you can't kiss your cat, what's Ian going to do on a Friday night? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's going to use common sense hygiene until we know more about the virus. When you get the all clear, you can, you can get off with it as much as you like. <laughs> Shouldn't they just say, don't kiss the cat for scientific reasons, but you're not supposed to kiss your cat. No, you're, you're meant to allow the cat to make the first move. <laughs> Consent is important, even in the animal kingdom. Yes, it's etiquette. Yeah, et etiquette. Mark's got exactly the right answer. It's etiquette. The cat kisses you, all bets are off. But before that, no kissing. We're, we're keeping um, <laughs> six foot apart in this house, I tell you. Sticking with animals, how might dogs be able to help us? Oh, sniffing. Haven't they been teaching dogs how to sniff out people with the virus? That is absolutely right. There's hope that uh, dogs can sniff out people with the coronavirus. Apparently, they can already sniff out malaria, diabetes and some form of cancer. And they reckon one dog can diagnose 250 people a day. So who needs an app, um, basically? <laughs> um, if you need any proof of the range of a dog's skills, have a look at this one, arranging a photo shoot. <laughs> oh, that's very sweet. Remember, don't kiss the cat. <laughs> yes, this is week nine of lockdown. It's thought lorry drivers coming through the Channel Tunnel may be exempt from quarantine restrictions, and presumably so will all the illegal immigrants in their lorry, because we're going to need them to pick the fruit. Speaking of which... Prince Charles has launched a campaign this week appealing to recruit an army of fruit pickers. Charles said, food doesn't appear by magic. Well, it does for you, Charles. You just ring a bell. <laughs> also this week, police broke up a protest in Hyde Park, which was calling for an end to the lockdown and the banning of 5G. The most high-profile arrest there was of Piers Corbyn, but only because they couldn't fit Eamon Holmes into the van. 
Paul and Mark, <laughs> bit of a mix up this week, okay? Bit of a change. Rather than a video montage, you get to play a fun game. Oh, isn't great. that exciting? Everyone's keen, of course, to get back to doing what they enjoy, but how will those activities have to change in the world of the new normal? Well, let's find out as I ask if you want to do that, what's the caveat? <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> Paul and Mark filming a TV drama. If you want to do that, what's the caveat? Is it that, okay? So filming TV series, I know that instead of exterior sequences, they're going to have a green screen, and the actors have to sort of spend, uh, you know, be the appropriate six feet apart. Is that the idea? Do they have to be in different rooms? So EastEnders will be like one person on Zoom going, "Shut it," and then someone else hundred miles away going, <laughs> "I'm going to turn you off." and not re-invite you to the meeting. Dish. <laughs> According to new guidance, actors are going to have to keep two metres apart, film outdoors as much as possible. So shooting scenes like this recent one from EastEnders is going to be quite a challenge. Um, because the cast have to stand so far apart, it's mainly going to just be footage of people bellowing at each other in EastEnders, so no change there then. Um, the BBC have said that filming will resume on EastEnders by the end of June, and coronavirus is going to be included as part of the storyline which is great news for soap fans because they're going to be seeing the characters use it on a very regular basis. <laughs> it's another new guideline that um, TV stars are going to have to drive themselves to the studio from now on, uh, which is going to mean a lot of glancing at the watch and, and nervous pacing up and down for deck. <laughs> uh, here's another thing you want to do, playing test cricket. If you want to do that, what's the caveat? Do you have to prove you know all of the rules before you're allowed to play? <laughs> or is the ball delivered so a blo so a bloke go comes yes. up and then you have to and then he has to stand back six feet and then yeah. delivers the ball and then the batsman comes. Yeah, he and has hits to sign it. for it as well. He yeah, has to sign yeah. for it. Yeah, uh, they're going to be banned from using saliva to shine the ball. Do you know what they're going to be allowed to use instead? Lucasade. Is it sandpaper? No, <laughs> no, it's uh, sweat. Sweat is less disgusting, apparently. It's hoped that Test Cricket will resume with a match against the West Indies on July the 8th, although what else won't be allowed? Spectators. Absolutely right. There won't be any spectators, which is a shame because it means thousands of cricket fans won't get the chance to chat amongst themselves and look at their phones. Um, <laughs> sticking with spectators, do you know what a <laughs> South Korean football team... Do you know what a South Korean football team uh, did to recreate a crowd during a recent match? Oh, yes, yes. There were sex dolls, apparently, uh, which the football club denied, but uh, amongst the keenest supporters, they recognised the product. You're right. Um, they randomly scattered sex dolls around the stands. There's a photo of it here. It's, it's charming. <laughs> they could become more realistic since my day. I mean, um, oh, I've never seen one of them before. <laughs> <laughs> the club owners denied they were sex dolls, saying they were actually premium mannequins, although they had to admit that several of the premium mannequins appeared to be holding up signs advertising porn sites. Um, <laughs> as you can see here. Apparently those are adverts <laughs> of porn sites. It's led to lots of complaints and a transfer request from Kyle Walker. <laughs> restaurants, <laughs> restaurants and cafes are coming up with ingenious ways to abide by social distancing rules so they can remain open for business. Uh, what is one Worcester cafe owner surrounding his customers with? Oh, is this the way he's making them wear pool noodles on their head? What's a pool noodle? It's a cross between a pullover and a poodle. <laughs> it's a it's a brightly coloured foam noodle. A giant it's like you hold on to. And you put it in the pool. So <laughs> there you go. There there you go. Look. Oh, that's brilliant. That's a cafe in Germany. That's to encourage people to remain apart. Are they meant to look like swastikas? What's going on there? <laughs> <laughs> That was Germany. This is Worcester. Um, it's a cafe owner called Francini Osorio. Um, he's been busy putting up 35 shower curtains. Here they are. This is uh, what it's like in his cafe. Those two have been waiting ages for their food, but the waiter can't find the opening in the curtains. Mr Osorio explained, I know it's a little bit weird to come into a cafe full of shower curtains. Not at all. Gastro pubs have been making us all drink out of jam jars and eat burgers off roof slates for years. <laughs> time now for round two, the Board of Education. Uh, normally at this time of year, students would be sitting their exams, so we're going to help them out by grilling you. Ian, you are up first. Your subject is... History. Keeping it topical, what did we learn about Henry VIII this week? He's dead. He is dead. 
whenever he went on um, a long journey or, or campaign, he took his own palace with him. He had a flat pack palace. This was easily the most <laughs> interesting story of the week. <laughs> And wherever he was, they put it up and it, it was made out of wood, but it had brick effect on it. So he felt he was in a little castle and it had a brilliant description of the windows were made not out of glass, but out of horn, which I thought, given it was Henry VIII, would probably have sort of kept him in the mood for various <laughs> wife expeditions. This week, historians have revealed that Henry wasn't a fan of camping, so he used to travel to battles with an easily erectable structure to stay in, or as the Daily Mail put it, a flat pack palace based on his real home. So it turns out Henry VIII was the first person to live in a mock Tudor house. <laughs> <laughs> Do you reckon that's the reason why Henry VIII got divorced so much? Because of weekends at, at uh, medieval Ikea? <laughs> and they were crawling around the floor going, where's the key for the battlements? <laughs> I reckon it would come in the form of, like, a Bayeux tapestry, basically. <laughs> You'd be looking at, like, with two guys holding a flipping... Get all the way to the end and then realise there's a tower upside down. <laughs> it was captured on the, uh, I guess, the equivalent of CCTV at the time, <laughs> an illustration of the Siege of Boulogne, which oh. may feature Henry's <laughs> flat pack palace... Here's the, the illustration. Can you spot the palace? Yes. Top right, next to the bigger palace, just below the tree. Uh, this, is, this is like a new BBC4 game show. <laughs> yeah. Where's, Are we looking for... Where's Henry? Where's Walloon? <laughs> That's it, apparently. Although why it's not the, the other palace on the other side, I don't know. Um, Paul, have a look at the blackboard. This is your subject. Yes. Art. Right. I'm going to show you a piece of art. Yes. Wonderful piece of art. I'd yep. like you to identify the subject. OK. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> last... I mean, this is obviously the same uh, artist that the very good head of Ian last week. I mean, I do have teeth, so I don't know why... <laughs> te that's terrible. I think the other heads behind are judging you as well by the looks of it. Well, one of them looks like Lon Chaney in The Phantom of the Opera, so I don't know what's going on. Apparently, Ian, you're lurking in the back of this picture. Oh, yeah, that's the one that I thought was Lon Chaney in Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> that is, in fact, You, Paul, by artist Penny Lally. Luckily for you, Paul, it's not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> well... You see, that's brilliant. I wish I hadn't oh, complained right. about the first one now. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very flattering. <laughs> well, well, my hair's not quite that dark and I haven't got a bum on me face, but other than that, it's perfect. <laughs> Let's face it, you usually see a picture like that with the words, police are looking for a man in his late 60s. <laughs> the phrase is, be careful what you beg for. <laughs> what did Katrina Britton from rugby do with five pounds worth of pasta this week? Oh. Well, if she didn't make a face of me, I'm happy. Did she build a sculpture? Did she make something practical? Did she make a rubbish birthday card like a five-year-old would? She uh, was unwilling to pay £160 for this chandelier. <laughs> so she recreated it herself using £5 worth of pasta. And here it is. Oh, that's actually quite good. It's made from conchigli pasta shells. <laughs> yeah. So she saved herself a few penes there. Hey. Um, <laughs> don't laugh, Ian. It'll only encourage more of the same. I think of all the objects that we've seen in the last 10 minutes, that's the one that resembles me the most. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, you are next. And your subject, if we look at the blackboard, your subject is geography. <laughs> you know, of course, not really. It's maths. Obviously, it's maths. I'm math. shocked. Um, shocked, I tell you. <laughs> what unorthodox lessons have maths students in Liverpool been receiving while on lockdown? I know this one. There's uh, someone who wants to reintroduce a Victorian textbook for students um, with uh, some amazing questions. And the reason why I know this one is because I actually have the textbook. This is head of the Liverpool Math School, Damien Haig. Uh, he said he struggled to stretch the minds of his brightest pupils using modern teaching materials. So he turned to the 1885 classic Elementary Algebra for schools. Can I read you a question from it? Please do. 110 bushels of coal are divided among a number of poor persons. If each had received one bushel more than he'd received, as many bushels as there are persons, how many poor persons were there? That's the kind of gem that you can get in this textbook. Do you want one more yeah, question go on. from... Yeah, go on. OK. In a cellar, one-fifth of the wine is port and one-third is claret. Besides this, it contains 15 dozen bottles of sherry and 30 bottles of spirits. How much port and claret does it contain? 
By the way, the question counts spirits as wine. What's the answer? Let him count his own bloody bottles. Why are we doing it for him? <laughs> the answer, <laughs> Six. in case anyone cares, is 90 bottles of port and 150 bottles of claret. So, I mean, you were close with six. 90 bottles of port, 150 bottles of claret, which at the moment would probably last most of us a weekend. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> Mark, your subject is this. Astronomy. Now, according to the Daily Star, what is the thickest being in the galaxy? Me. Someone at NASA said that it's possible that over the next couple of years we might find life on other planets. And then someone said, but it won't be particularly intelligent. And so that's how long it took for the Daily Star to manage to come up with interplanetary racism and go, yeah, it's all right then. <laughs> Aliens are that coming from other galaxies, but they're thick. They know nothing. Yeah, you're right. And actually, they didn't. it wasn't just... They managed to also get a bit of uh, toilet humour in there. Uh, as they unhelpfully explained with their front page, Aliens are dumber than Uranus. Astronomer Dr Sheila Kanani thinks any aliens out there are likely to be dumb little microbes without intelligence. We all know how harmless those can turn out to be. <laughs> exactly. It's time now for the odd one out round. Uh, fingers on buzzers. You do have buzzers. Uh, Hannah, thank you. That's your buzzer. Uh, Mark, have you got a buzzer? That's adorable. Uh, Ian, where's your buzzer? Um, I borrowed this from a, 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 a showbiz cat friend of mine. You hear that? Yes, so can every dog in a 200-mile radius, I think, can hear that. Paul, have you got your buzzer ready? Yes, I have. Uh, hang on a second, are you ready? I think she did a sculpture of the dummy. <laughs> OK, here we go. Going to put the whistle in. Here's the whistle. <whistles> OK. Your four are Pinocchio, Kia Starmer, Sir Kia Starmer, George Washington and Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, this is about lying. Pinocchio was a boy whose nose grew uh, longer when he told lies. George Washington, he always said um, there was a story about him chopping down a cherry tree and he told his father he couldn't tell a lie. You're not on, quite on the right lines there, I'm afraid. Have they all attended sage meetings, apart from Keir Starmer? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I think it's something to do with donkeys. Oh, yes. Well, OK, so Pinocchio turns into a donkey. That one's fine. Uh, and then Keir Starmer, the fields that he bought for, like, £10 in 1978 was so his mum could keep a donkey, wasn't it? So wh who are you saying is the odd one out here? Uh, Washington? It's not Washington. What you need to think about is what happened, something that happened to Pin Pinocchio. He turned into a donkey and all the others looked after donkeys. That's right. That's right. They've all owned a donkey, except for Pinocchio, who turned into one. You'd want to keep away from Pinocchio at the moment because with that nose of his, uh, a sneeze from him would be like it was coming out of a rifle. It'd be like a <laughs> coronavirus sniper. How did we find out Keir Starmer owns a donkey? You just told us. It was thanks to this article in the Mail on Sunday. Man of the people! New Labour leader Sir Keir owns land worth up to £10 million. Later in the piece, the Mail specify that this land is actually a field large enough for 70 houses. <laughs> and hidden at the very end of the article, a spokesperson for Starmer tells them the field is not for sale and no one <laughs> has been shown around it. In other words... The story is a pile of shit, which could be worth up to £25 million if someone builds a housing estate on it. Why do you think the press have, have got it in for uh, Keir Starmer? Well, I, I think it's because his popularity rating has suddenly gone up. And this is partly to do with the fact that he's, he's performed quite well um, in the House of Commons. And uh, I'm afraid it was the Daily Telegraph, which is normally guaranteed to be a bit of a, a, bit of a cheerleader for the government, said that Starmer had um, taken um, Boris apart. It probably is because he's been using his lawyer skills to give Boris Johnson a hard time during PMQs. Let's take a quick look. Last week, I showed the Prime Minister his own slide, showing that the UK now has the highest death total in Europe and second highest in the world. A version of this slide has been shown at the number 10 press conference every day since the 30th of March. That's seven weeks. Yesterday, the government stopped publishing the international comparison 
and the slide is gone. Why? The staunchly pro-Boris Daily Telegraph said that Starmer had taken him apart like a Duplo <laughs> train set. <laughs> ah, yes. To be fair, Boris has probably bought a few of those in his time. <laughs> so there is a certain worry that um, the Labour Party have come up with a leader who isn't totally unelectable. And that really is not playing the game. <laughs> What's Jacob Rees-Mogg's solution to the problem? Jacob's solution is that we should have everyone coming back to the Commons because then people will um, congregate round Boris and make him feel better and cheer and so therefore he won't not be able to answer the questions anymore. His spirits will revive with people going hurrah and then he'll answer these questions with incredible forensic brilliance with attention to detail and all the things he's known for. Yes, you're right. He is demanding, Jacob Rees-Mogg is demanding MPs go back to set an example but really, it's to provide the laughter track that uh, Boris is clearly missing. <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> How did George Washington get his donkey? Uh, he won him in a raffle. No. He had wooden teeth, didn't he? There's nothing wrong with wooden teeth, Mark. Some of my best friends have wooden teeth, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what have Arnold Schwarzenegger and his pet donkey Lulu been doing over the last few weeks? Please keep it legal. Well, he's, he's obviously been taking it for walks uh, on a treadmill in his own private gymnasium in his home in Los Angeles. Uh, kind of. He's been making online videos advising over 65s, like Arnie himself, to stay home. As well as Lulu, the videos also feature another pet called Whiskey, who is a miniature horse. Ah. It's actually a normal horse. Normal <laughs> horse, except when Arnie stands next to him. <laughs> what do you think Lulu the donkey celebrated recently? Her birthday? Did he get her some some donkey cake? You're absolutely right. It was her first birthday. Would you like to see Arnold Schwarzenegger singing happy birthday to his pet donkey? More than anything. Uh, yes. No, not really. You're in luck. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lulu. Happy birthday to you. So many things about that video. The video makes you want to wash your hands in so many ways. <laughs> They've all owned a donkey, except for Pinocchio, who got turned into one. Um, Pinocchio's nose grew longer every time he told a lie. Just as well that doesn't happen in real life, or Matt Hancock would have your eye out, even from two metres away. <laughs> Less topical development, George Washington was given a donkey by the King of Spain, which he called Royal Gift. Not very imaginative, but it made a good pet for his first child, Unexpected Bastard. <laughs> Time now for the Missing Words round, which this week features as its guest publication, Welsh Springer Spaniel Club Newsletter. You know, it's, it's very hard to put it down, but sometimes it's just for the best. <laughs> Man in Yorkshire claims his collection of 14,200. What is a world record? Speeding fines. Toilet rolls. Hoarding bastard. <laughs> Man in Yorkshire claims his collection of 14,200 gripes is a world record. The answer is crisp packets. Crisp packets, obviously. It's, it's Gary Key from Yorkshire who spent eight years collecting crisp packets, which he then rolls into tiny balls and collects. Gary's collection of thousands of empty crisp packets is indeed a world record, although admittedly the second largest collection is four, and that's only because I haven't put my recycling out. <laughs> Next, the monthly Welsh Springer Spaniel gathering saw unusually high numbers thanks to what? The Welsh Springer cat gathering being on the same day due to a booking error. Is it just a massive bone? <laughs> I beg your pardon? Thanks to Pretty Patel doing the numbers on the door. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, in fact, obviously, two new people from Cardiff turning up. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> <laughs> the article also revealed that the walk ended with a pint in the dog-friendly Prince of Wales, not to be confused with the child-friendly Duke of York, which is a pub. It's another pub. I'm just naming a pub. <laughs> the key to what is being tall and from Liverpool? The key to having a Scouse accident and then being over six foot. Annual Welsh Springer Spaniel Grooming Award is being tall yes. and from Liverpool. Yes. Key to looking over a wall in the dingle. The answer is the key to being a comedy genius oh. is being tall uh, and from Liverpool, apparently. One of the Oscar tall Liverpoolians referred to uh, was, <laughs> well, Ken Dodd. Ken Dodd. Did you look, see Ken Dodd? Although he is... And Richard he is, Pryor. 
he's cheating on the height thing with that hat, basically. <laughs> um, next headline. Japanese toaster will make you best slice of toast in the world, but be warned, it what? Doesn't care about your sourdough starter. <laughs> the answer is it costs £348. Wow. £348 is a lot of money to spend on a toaster, but it's still better value than a crate of PPE from Turkey. <laughs> um, a room full of hairy ears and panting. It can only be what? It's a Hobbit reunion dinner. <laughs> I think I'm going to give you that. It is the Welsh Springer Spaniel Club grooming day. One grooming demonstrator showed how, instead of the usual clippers, she does nails with a Dremel grinder, a very efficient method, but not for all dogs, as Tripod, the three-legged spaniel, <laughs> will testify. <laughs> Scientists crack secret code of 80 gestures used by what? Melania Trump's body double. Very good suggestion. The answer is chimpanzees. This is according to British primatologist Dr Kat Hobater, who spent 13 years studying chimps in Uganda. Apparently this means let's go. This means come here. And this means shut up. I'm trying to write Hamlet. <laughs> Next, man breaks into museum to what? Man breaks into museum to make an exhibition of himself. <laughs> this man breaks into museum to take selfies with the T-Rex skeleton. Uh, <laughs> is that Mark Bolan? <laughs> 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 and finally, Gucci's new £675 handbag looks like what? Uh, looks like Paul. It was designed by an artist to look like Paul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole Kidman. Does it just look like shit? Looks like bargain compared to pasta chandelier. <laughs> the answer is Gucci's new £675 handbag looks like a builder's rubble tub. <laughs> Just to decipher that, this week Gucci unveiled this new bag, uh, which was immediately compared to this bag used for builder's rubble. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. There you go. Uh, <laughs> it does look like shit. The worst thing about the Gucci bag is 675 quid is just an estimate. <laughs> so the final scores are Paul and Mark have five. Yay. Ian and Hannah have six. Yay. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Hannah. <laughs> you see, that's what happens if you have a scientist on board. <laughs> but before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. Ian and Hannah get this. New sculpture of Paul Merton wows Chelsea Flower Show. <laughs> Lockdown not good for Titchmarsh. Although he's looking younger. That's true, and more like Paul McCartney. <laughs> I could look over this wall if I was from the Dingle, but I can't because I'm only a little fella. <laughs> Paul and Mark, you get this. Black and white bears wasted in colour photograph. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, uh, we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and Hannah Fry. Paul Merton and Mark Steele, and I leave you with the news that as Boris Johnson plans to visit Berlin for a pandemic summit, Angela Merkel is looking forward to explaining the health check protocols for arrivals from Britain. <laughs> 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 Good night.